So students, we have seen uh, the layer structure of the file system code and we are going to deal with the lower two layers today. That is the disk driver code and the buffer cache code. So the set of functions for the disk driver as uh, mentioned on the slide, id, wait, init, start, interrupt and read, write. These actually constitute the code of the device driver for the disk. And on top of it, we have the code in DAO.C. Uh, those are related to <coughs> the buffer cache handling. So I'll come back to the slide. Um, first, uh, let me share my terminal. Um, okay, let me share my terminal. Fine. So here is my terminal. And uh, let me go to id start. All right, so this is the file called id.c. Let me go to the top. You will see that in this file id.c, there are certain macros defined. For example, sector size, some macros which are basically status of the id controller and some macros which essentially define the commands to be issued to the disk controller. You will notice there is a global variable called IDEQ. So this is a, a pointer to a struct called buff and we will now in some time visit the struct buff. But basically this is a head or node pointer to a singly linked list which acts as a queue. I will repeat this IDEQ is a head node pointer to a list which acts as a queue. And this is the queue of the buffers which are to be written or read from the hard disk. So we are right now seeing the code of the hard disk device driver. So obviously this device driver will handle the buffers to be written to the disk in a particular order, in a FIFO order. And this is the queue for that. There is a variable called hard disk 1. It is actually uh, set to 1 if you have one extra hard disk and actually uh, if you have noted it down you actually have two hard disks when you are using xv6 so the zero hard disk is the xv6.img file and uh, the first file that is second file actually but index number one is the ss.img file so let me go to the make file so you will see that there is a creation of a file called fs.img so you will see that the mkfs runs on fs.img and we have already seen how the xv6.img gets created so let me go to yeah. so this is how xv6.img gets created so these are the two hard disk in question so the hard disk is hard disk one is set to one when you have a second hard disk that is fs.img you try removing fs.img and you will see that the code fails uh, on setting hard disk equal to 1. Now let us review the functions that we have in this particular file. Uh, first there is a function called id wait, then there is a function called id init, then id start, then here is a id interrupt, and then there is a function called ide read write. So coming back. These are the five functions which exist in this particular file. Let me tell you overall what these functions do. This is called in the beginning to initialize the disk driver. So it has to be called once. <coughs> this function id read write is called every time you need to do a i or o input or output. So this is the same function which will get called irrespective of whether you want to do input or output from the disk. This function id start is actually called by id read write in case it thinks that the disk controller needs a start. You know that it thinks that the disk controller is not working. So let us start the disk controller. So id read write will call id start if only needed. The id wait basically checks if the disk controller is ready to accept the next request. So it is a simple loop function which keeps waiting for the disk controller to be ready. And this function id interrupt is actually the interrupt handler which gets called when there is a disk IO interrupt. 
So you will notice that the ID read write, ID RW, and ID INTR, these are counterparts of each other. ID read write will schedule a read using the disk device driver, and ID interrupt will get automatically called by the interrupt handler when the read or write is completed. So these are the five set of functions. Now we'll go and see the code of these five functions. We begin with ID read write because ID read write is called the most number of times. First, I'll show you all mentions of the code of ID read write. So these are all the mentions of the code of ID read write. You will notice that it is getting called from these two functions, B read and B write. So B read and B write basically refer to reading of a buffer and writing of a buffer. So these are the upper layer functions. They come from the buffer cache. So essentially, they are going to call the device driver function ID read write. This is a prototype declaration, and this is the code of the particular function. Right now, we'll skip this particular mention of the code. Okay. So basically, it is getting called from B read and B write. What does this do? Now, for the first time, we are encountering a structure called buff. Now, please understand that this buff is actually a part of the buffer cache being handled by the operating system and it also acts as a parameter to the device driver so the device driver has to understand the struct buff that is why the device driver code is not only hard disk specific but it is also OS specific because it acts as a bridge between the hard disk and the, <coughs> the rest of the operating system so it has to understand the buffer cache of the operating system and it has to understand the underlying disk controller as well. So let us go and see what is this struct buff first. So here is struct buff. The important field in buff are these two. There is a block number. So every buffer will actually be storing a particular block that has been read from the disk. So that block number is mentioned in the struct buffer. This is a array of size B size. B size is 5 and 2 in this case. This is where the actual data is cached. So suppose you are reading block number 100, then the data block number 100 will be stored in this array and this will be set to 100. There is a field called dev because one device driver can handle multiple devices of the same type. So if you have four hard disks of the type IDE, then you don't need one device driver per disk. One single device driver can handle all the four disks because they are identical in their hardware characteristics. So, but if you read now data from hard disk number one or hard disk number two or hard disk number three, you should remember that you have read it from that particular disk. So that is remembered in this device number field, which is a inter, uh, which is an unsigned read. So together the device number and the block number identify uniquely a particular sector on the disk or on a particular disk. So their block number and data, these three are very important fields of the buff. They identify a block and also the data of the block. Now obviously if you are going to read from the hard disk, then this data will be filled in by the read operation. But if you are trying to write to the disk, then the data from this array will be taken and written to the disk. All right, so that is the role of these three variables. There is a reference count here, which is basically the number of processes that are currently using this buffer. So that tells us whether anybody is right now, any process is right now interested in this buffer. And we will see how the RF count gets incremented and decremented. Right now, we are going to skip this locking, slip lock, lock. We are going to skip this. The flags, they are actually going to have values either valid or dirty. So if the flag is valid, then it means that the data in the buffer is identical with the data on the disk. That is what it means if you say B valid. Now, this will normally be true when you have just read the buffer from the disk. The B dirty will be true if the buffer has been modified. So that means the data on the disk and data in the buffer are not synced together. That is why the buffer actually needs to be returned back to the disk. Any questions on the concept of buffer? Right? Before we see the these remain three fields. <coughs> 
note that the word buffer is used in so many contexts in so many ways that sometimes people get confused but when we are talking about this struct buff we are talking about the struct buff that will be part of the buffer cache all right now you will see there is a pointer next and previous so there are a lot of buffers and all those buffers basically get linked in a doubly circular linked list using this previous and next the buffers are actually maintained uh, in a lru fashion uh, lru stands for least recently used fashion and because it's a doubly circular list you can also say it is a mru fashion because if you traverse it in one order you get lru so if you traverse it in the other order you will get a mru so the buffers are actually maintained in a lru fashion this pointer q next is used only if this buffer is currently being operated upon by the driver this driver so basically because this buffer is undergoing some io either it is being read or it is being written in that case this q next will be used to actually link it on this q all right so that is the concept let me check the chat if there are any questions all right no questions in the chat so coming back all right to the core of id read write this is the id read write so id read write gets a buffer pointer so obviously the upper layer now will have access to the buffer that is why it has passed it to the this driver this buffer should now have the device number the block number already set if the buffer is dirty it has to be written and so on now initially we have some error checking code out of which let us skip this part holding lock holding slip lock code what does this code do it is checking if the buffer is marked as valid now there is no point why a read write should be called on a buffer which is valid valid means that the buffer contents and the disk contents are identical then there is no point to write it to the disk it can simply be discarded and the no problem will happen on the disk and obviously because it is valid you don't want to read it and that is why if this condition is true the kernel will panic and it means it will stop working next is the check and this check is actually assuring that the second hard disk is not on this project so as i told you i won't work remove the fs dot mg run x6 you will notice that the kernel stops working with this panic line of instruction because you don't have the second disk we will see where the hard disk one comes from and so on we'll see all that part now what does the read write code do you will notice that what it is doing it is setting the q next of buffer to zero so null basically then it is iterating over the id q remember the global variable id q iterating over it till it reaches the end and making the last structure point to the buffer so basically appending to the id q so there is already a q you are appending the buffer to that q that is the simple job then it is checking if this was the first buffer on the list in that case it will start the disk controller if it was not the first buffer it is assuming that the disk controller is continuously working to uh, remove a buffer from the queue and keep doing read and write on that next it is going to call sleep and sleep basically suspends the process that is it makes it wait as long as the buffer is not valid because now we are doing the out after the out the buffer should become valid because the contents of the buffer and the disk should match so you are just going to wait for the contents to become proper that is what this loop is going to do all right let's see the core of id start as i told you id start is only called optionally if there is a the id read write was called on the first buffer so what does this code do this code does actually the interesting work it does the conversion from the block number to sector number so you will see here it is calculating sectors per block it is calculating the actual sector number it is deciding which command 
to is to be issued depending on whether one sector is there or multiple sectors are there it is assuring that the sector square block is less than 7 and now all these instructions here you will see are in and out instructions so they are basically instructions to io ports giving instructions to the hardware controller to do the io you will notice here that if the flag is dirty then what it is doing it is calling a out sl which is basically a loop this instruction is a loop to read the buffer data and write it to a particular port so that the data is made available to the this controller and because the buffer was dirty it is supposed to be read and otherwise it is supposed to be uh, buffer is dirty so it is to be written otherwise it is to be read so the read command the write command are issued based on that so the interesting thing is that there is no separate read or write argument here in id read write there is no separate argument to read or write just by looking at the flags in the buffer the device driver is concluding whether it is to it is to be written or read if no flags are set it has to be read if the dirty flag is set it has to be written if the valid flag is set you will not come to this function if the valid flag was set you will panic in the id read write function so that is what is happening in this particular function id start all right now uh, remember the argument here is b size by 4 because Uh, the io is happening in four byte terms that is word size and that is why the out sl runs 512 by four times okay and that is the logic here so we have seen the core of id read write and id start all right both of these assume that the disk controller was initialized and it was executing and it was running and so on the disk controller is given instructions by id start remember uh, after the id start Uh, is issued the disk controller will run it will do the io and then it will raise the interrupt this interrupt to inform that the disk io is complete and then you will come into this id interrupt this is the interrupt handler let us just verify where it is called from you will notice that it is called from trap and trap is where all the interrupts actually come so in trap you will see that it is checking if the trap number matches the irq ide and in that case it is calling id interrupt so what does id interrupt do let's keep the locking code here it is checking that the idq is null if it is null you know then basically there are no more buffers okay on the queue to do io if that is not true then it is assuming and this is very interesting and it's a very simple mechanism and simple data structure what it is assuming that the io was issued on the first buffer on the queue so the critical question always lies is when a disk interrupt arrives how do you know it was interrupt for which io for which block for which buffer was the interrupt there and x86 has a very simple idea of resolving it it assumes that it was for the first buffer on the queue all right that's very simple it always issues the io for the first buffer on the queue and it assumes that the interrupt occurred for the first buffer on the queue so what it is doing it is moving to the next one because the queue is not empty now if there was a read and in that particular case it has the data has to be read into the buffer so this insa which is a repetitive instruction uh, assembly instruction doing the reading will read from this input port into the buffer next you are setting the value flag on the buffer because the io is done properly you are removing the dirty flag if it was there and calling a wake up on the process remember the process was sleeping so let me go to the sleeping part again the process was sleeping here waiting for the flag to be valid so here you are going to wake up the process which are waiting on the buffer we have not yet seen the code of sleep and wake up we will see it some other day and this is an interesting piece of code what it is doing it is calling id start again if the queue is not empty so simple way of understanding it if it was the first io call using id read write it will call id start after that every disk io interrupt handler code will keep calling id start if the queue is not empty 
So this will keep coming as long as the queue is not empty. And this is how the disk IO interval handling takes place. The only part we are not yet seeing is the init. Okay, and the ID weight. So ID weight, as, as you will see, it's a busy loop. It basically does some IO to check that the disk controller is ready or not. ID init is called only once in the beginning. So obviously the guest should be it is called from the main. And you will notice that here in main the call is made. So this is the ID init which is being called from main. So we have seen some functions from main. Now we will see the ID init. What is ID init doing? You will notice that all the code it has got is waiting for the ID controller and again doing some out and in instructions to actually initialize the controller and checking that the disk number one is present. So this out and in instructions verify that there is a disk number one and the how this one equal to one is set here. So this, this is the code which is going to check that you have a fs.img also present. Now where is this one being set from? If you look at the make file and you look at KMO, so these are KMO options, you will see that there is a file equal to fs.img index equal to 1. This index equal to 1 is actually made available to the disk controller. Disk controller makes it available to id init with the help of these instructions. And that is how we are going to set have this equal to 1. Homework again for you. Rather than removing fs.img, just try changing this path and ensure that your kernel panics, saying that the disk number 1 is absent. So, okay, let me go to id init again. So, okay, this is id init. We have seen the code of id init and id wait. Uh, we should not be much concerned about id wait and id init because they are essentially supporting pieces of code. The real pieces of code are id start id interrupt and id read write so these three actually constitute the core of the disk device driver any questions on the disk device driver the only critical data structure here is the id queue all right this is a singly linked null, null terminated queue of buffers which are to be written onto the disk and this queue is implemented using this queue next as I said. All right. Okay, I'll wait one minute to get your questions. Let me check the chat. Okay, no questions in the chat. Okay. Let me move on now to the code of buffer cache. So we have covered this code. Uh, I think you can read the slides later. The buffer cache code is in bio.c and there are these five functions b init, b get, b read, b write, and b reels. B release actually, it's spelled as else, but it should be called b release. So let us begin with the code of B in it. Uh, but I think now you can uh, actually make a logical guess from the name of the functions. B get, as the name suggests, will basically read a buffer. And it should definitely deal with a particular block number. It will get a buffer for a particular block number. All right. And B read will actually read the data into that particular buffer. B write will write it back. Let us see what B init does. B init is called from main and this initializes the buffer cache. So let us go to main again. Okay, not this main. This main. So we have seen id init is called and before that you will see B init is called. B init, you will see deals with the hair and previous all these pointers. So let's first see what is this B cache. B cache is here. You will see B cache is a global structure 
inside it it has a struct called head and it has got the array of struct buff the array is also called buff and it has n buff element that is 30 n buff is 30 so when we say buffer cache it is actually this array which is the buffer cache the interesting thing is that this array is not handled by the array this array is used actually to implement the doubly circular linked list of buffers in the ORU or MRU, whatever you want to say it, the fashion. So what is being done here? If you read this code, the head pointer, the head structure is actually used as the previous and the head uh, previous and next pointers to the beginning and the end of the list. And all you are doing here is you are linking every structure to the next structure to form a doubly circular linked list. So B unit basically does this. So the struct B cache, okay, this is the struct B cache. It has a head, buff, and lock. So this is the lock, and this is the head, and in between this, this, this is the array of buffers. This head is actually used to link all these structures as shown. All right. So uh, you can actually ignore the naming. I have done N and P. I think they could have been reverse, n should have been p and p should have been n because diagrammatically that is how we normally deal with. Uh, but this is still not incorrect diagram. So basically the, the structures get linked like this in a doubly circular list. Now why are they linked like this? Because what will happen in future, if you want to read a particular block, uh, this will be taken out or it will get actually move to the beginning of the list depending on whether it is LRU or MRU buffer. If you are reading a number, maybe this will be taken out and it will move ahead or before in the list. So this list will not look like this in future. It may look something like this pointer going here, then this going here, then this going maybe back here, this going somewhere here, this going somewhere here, and essentially like this, it will again point back to the head. All right. So that is how the structures will keep moving all right, as you keep using them. And to begin with, the data structure looks like this. So we have already seen the struct buff and these are the previous and next pointers which are going to actually create the cache list. So let's see the code of the buffer cache now. So this is the buffer cache. To begin with in B in it, you have linked all the structures in a doubly circular list. Right. Let's begin with B get. All right. So as I said, B get is given a block number and the device number. So any upper layer which is trying to read a particular buffer will have to know the block number and will have to know the device number as well. Let's see how we are calling B get. Okay. You will see that uh, B get is basically called from B read, and that is the only place from where it is called. So what does bget do? Uh, let's ignore the acquire function. You will see that there are two loops in this function, only two loops. What is the first loop doing? First loop starts with the head pointer, traverses the next chain, and just checks if there is already a buffer with the given device and block number. Now what happens, there are a lot of processes running, Many of them are trying to perhaps read the same file and even if they are not, most of them are interested in the super block or a particular directory block and many of them will be actually reading the same part of the disk data structure again and again. So it is possible that for example, you started one program which opened the file slash a slash b slash c and another program opened the file slash a slash b slash d but then the slash a slash b part was common, so those buffers might have been already read, and that means the buffer might already be present. So here the, you are checking that, if the buffer is present, all you are doing is returning the pointer to it. That's it, by increasing the reference count. So one more process dealing with this buffer now. If not, so that means it is not cached, then what you have to do? You have to now use the unused buffer. And the rule of unused buffers is that you go, you pick them up in the least recently used fashion. Now the least recently used has starts with the tail end, so you will start basically with the previous 
Quantum and you will traverse it in the reverse order because the list is maintained in MRU fashion. The next 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 pointers are MRU pointers. So the previous previous pointers are LRU pointers. So you are going to iterate in the reverse order. Basically looking for a buffer with reference count zero because if it is zero, then nobody is using it, and also the buffer should not be dirty. Then all you do here is you initialize it with the device number and the block number. Set the reference count to one because you are the first one to access it. No flags because the buffer is you know just ready to use. It contains no data, and then returning a pointer. So keep it in mind. All right, B get doesn't read data. B get simply returns a buffer with the device and the block number in it. All right, B get simply returns a buffer with the device and the block number set into the buffer. Now let us see what B read does. As the name suggests, B read is supposed to read a particular block. So given a device number and block number, it does a B get and simply calls ID read write. If the valid flag is not set. On the buffer, that's all it does. Now remember, if we get returned the cached buffer, the valid flag will be set. Right? If we get returned the empty buffer, the valid flag will not be set. In that case, you will have to read it, and you call id read write. And we know what id read write does. So b read is very simple. It simply gets a ready to use buffer either with data or without data. And if it contains no data, then it calls id read write. Simple function b read. So we only need a function called B write and B write because the name is B write. It is called only when the buffer is to be returned. So it will simply set the flag to dirty because remember, unless the flag is set to dirty, you cannot call read write on it. Right? You cannot write it actually. So all you do is set the flag to dirty and call id read write. Now remember, the upper layers are going to basically use the buffer, store data in it, get data from it. They are going to use the data. The job of the buffer cache layer is simply to act as a cache of buffers to speed up to speed up the execution of the kernel. The job of the buffer cache layer is to make available an in-memory buffer. It it was already there to avoid unnecessary disk I/O. So the avoiding of the unnecessary disk I/O is happening here. This is going to avoid the unnecessary disk I/O. This is essential, crucial job of the buffer cache to avoid unnecessary I/O. So that was B read and B write. Next is B reads or B release actually. What is B release doing? Let's ignore this code, the locking code. It simply decrements the reference count. Remember when the re reference count was incremented. It was incremented in B get. Before any process works on a buffer, it has to do a B get. Before it wants to do a B write on it, it has to do a B get. Then read, and only then it can write. Now you want to give up a buffer. You say I am done with the buffer, so I want to. I no longer want to use it. Then you will call B release. B release will simply decrement the reference count. That's it. And only if the reference count is zero, that means you are the last process, last process which was using this buffer. Then what is happening? You will notice all this pointer manipulation code because this buffer is now made free. It is no longer being used. So can you try to read this code and try to make sense of this? Okay, take two three minutes to read this code and try to tell me what this code is doing. This is definitely playing with the buffer cache. The doubly circular linked list, as the name, as the code suggests, very easily. But what is happening to the particular buffer? Can you try to read it and try to give it a meaning? What is this code doing? Okay, I'm waiting for some messages to appear in the chat or someone to speak. It's a doubly circular linked list code. Okay, no one, I take your time. <laughs> 
Okay, still no messages in the chat. So the buffer is being removed from the doubly uh, linked circular list and mm -hmm. it is being added to the B cache. No. Uh, it was already in the B cache. It always remains in the B cache. No buffer ever gets out of the B cache. The W circular link list always contains all the 30 buffers. It always contains all the 30 buffers. What happens is that they keep moving here and there in the list. So as the comment here says, this code simply moves the buffer to the head of the MRU list. These two lines are basically removing, you know, it, the, the buffer was somewhere in the list earlier. It is basically linking the previous and the next nodes now. This line suggests you that the buffer is taken at the head of the list now. And this is simply pointing the previous, next cup previous to the, the same buffer. So this is taking to the buffer to the beginning of the list. So this is the most recently used buffer. And that is true because the bill is being called on that buffer just now. So this is actually the most recently used buffer. And remember, when you are going to find a victim buffer in bget, if the buffer already did not exist in the list, you are going to get the buffer from the tail of the list. So this buffer on which you just now called b-release will unlikely be dealt with. How does it benefit? See, you are simply decrementing the reference count. Are you removing the device number? Are you removing the block number? Nothing like that. The buffer is on the list. It is at the head of the list. It is at the head of the list. It still contains the data. It still has a device number, block number. That is why if in near future, somebody is going to call a bget on it, this loop is going to find it very immediately. Because this is on the, M this, this searching is happening in the MRU fashion. So B release simply decreases the reference count and if the reference count becomes zero, it will move the buffer to the beginning of the MRU list so that the buffer can be found very easily once again. So this is how the B get, B read and B write, they work together and B init initializes the buffer cache. So we are done with B init, B get, B write, B write and B release. These are the five functions of the buffer cache. Together they manipulate the Array. So basically in this diagram, there are always 30 buffers and the list always contains 30. The buffers basically keep moving to the front of the list and around. So maybe this pointer we will go here, it will go here, as I said earlier, this, this, this. Maybe this simply comes back here, this goes here, this goes here and then this comes back. But then all that is happening is that the buffers are moving back and forth in the list. The list always contains 30 buffers. Head arrow next is always MRU and head dot previous is always the LRU buffer. So this is a very simple buffer cache code actually. It's a very, very simple primitive buffer cache code. Interestingly, uh, the uh, uh, mechanism is very simple. It's a very simple linked list. Uh, often operating systems employ more complicated data structures to improve performance. Uh, but then X26 has this very, very nice and simple approach. So this was about the code of the buffer cache. Now whenever, remember in future, we make a call to any one of these functions, you should remember what these functions do. Most of the times the call is going to be to b read and b write and b get and b release. b init is called only once from me. We will not see calls to these functions because these are called from the, the buffer cache. So we are only going to see calls to b get, b read, b write and b release. Remember what they do. B, b get will simply get a block and the only place from which b get is called is b read. So we are going to see the calls to only these three functions, b read, b write and b release. b read will get a buffer, write data into it. b write will take a buffer, write the data back to the disk. b release will simply possibly move it around the cache. So I'll only also show you where all they get called from. B release, you will see is getting called from so many places. B release is getting called from read R, write R, I truncate, B map, R, so many places because 
if you talk about the upper layer which is dealing with the tree structured hierarchy of the file system they need to actually access so many blocks and every access to the block will basically go through you know functions like b read b write and b release who are calling b write you will see that uh, b write is uh, more or less actually called from very few places why we will understand when we actually see the code of logging in the next lecture you will see that b write is getting called from write head and write log and install transaction so why from only these few places we will see when we see the code of logging in the next class and opposed to that b read b read is getting called from so many places 19 places again you will see write i read i b map i log i update whenever you want to read i node or anything else you are going to call this particular function okay so for example reading super block you need to read a disk right to allocate a block you have to allocate read bit, bit map you have to read the disk you want to allocate i node you have to read a buffer so you are going to read buffer you want to truncate i node you are going to read a buffer which contains the i node and so on so every time you want to read something from the disk you are going to call b read the only interesting thing we have to learn is why is b read called b write called so less number of times that we will learn when we learn the code of intent logging journaling in the next lecture so any questions uh, uh, the lecture is over from my side if you have any questions i'll handle them virin has asked a question so is it ensured that no buffer is lost when you set the pointer just point to the next and previous of any node as you saw yes so obviously nothing should ever get lost right if you are losing if you are losing control of your allocated memory then it's a bad code you are creating garbage memory right so Uh, if, if your question means that is it ensured that all the 30 structures are always on the list? Answer is yes. But then they keep moving here and there in the list. So remember, in that list, some structures may contain valid data, some structures may contain valid data, but nobody is using them. Some structures will be unused structures, and some will actually be on the read-write queue of the disk driver. i'll wait for one more question uh, okay iron uh, how is it ensured that those 30 buffer structures are never lost i don't understand you iron how is it ensured we just now saw all the code that modifies all those structures so first of all we have b init in b init all the structures so you will see this loop iterates over the array and this is the only code which iterates over the array it is linking every structure onto a list fine Where else do you deal with that? Okay, simply look at all the instances of B cache ahead. Okay, so you will see that uh, it is B reels, B release, and B get where actually you deal with that. Nowhere else you are dealing with the B cache ahead. What do you do in B get? You are simply iterating. Is this modifying the list? Not at all. B get is not modifying the list at all. Who is modifying the list? The only function which is modifying the list is B release. this is the only function which is modifying the list does it answer your question aryan all right virin has a question at any point if you have a pointer to any buffer then we can essentially access each and every buffer from that by doing next previous and all answer is yes but you should not <laughs> the answer is yes <laughs> but you should not like why would you like to do that that is the question what is in your kernel that demands that you do that right it's like saying this that you have a you can have a implementation of a stack using doubly circular link structures then you can say ah because this is doubly circular structures i can traverse that stack you can traverse it but why did you do it because you wanted to have a stack so this data structure is a mru or a structure and it is manipulated to be like that and i don't see any other reason to manipulate it in any other way all right very more questions <laughs>
what happens when all the buffers are busy and particular process wants to read from the disk obviously then it is going to wait so you just wait for this you know when we see the upper layer code we will come to it so for example fine uh, let me show you here no buffers if there is no buffer available this will panic saying no buffers does it partially answer your question b get will panic if it cannot b get a buffer okay more questions Okay, so I'll stop now and I'll see all of you on Monday.